This is lecture 5b for History 111. So I was talking about the Persian empires last time, and I want to continue with that. But I want to talk about what, uh, how the, the Persian empires were bigger in size quantitatively, but that led to qualitative changes because they had to do a lot of innovations to try to manage this big an empire. Right? And so if you look at, on a map, if you look at the maps that I've been putting up there, you'll see that you know, ancient Samaria was these little city-states that you know, controlled the, you know, 20 square miles or something like that, um, 50 square miles, 100 square miles. Um, but then they got gobbled up by larger emperors like the Assyrian Empire, which covered most of Mesopotamia. Well, and, and if you think of Harappan civilization, that was the, the one or two river valleys. But then you look at the, the Persian empires, especially the Achaemenid founded by Cyrus the Great, and you suddenly see that they, these are stretching. The, the Achaemenid Empire included the entire Harappan civilization plus Persia plus the entire Mesopotamian civilization plus, at various points, the, the entire uh, Egyptian civilization. And so it's really many, 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 many times bigger, and it's thousands of miles from one end to the other. And so, and this means that it, several things. One is it means it's much harder to for governments to communicate, right? They've still got to send out, the government has to send out orders. They have to uh, receive information from what's going on in the countryside. They got to hold this all together. They need a lot of communication to happen. And that's really hard when you're talking about going over mountain ranges and going hundreds or thousands of miles. The second thing is they've got multiple ethnic communities here, right? They've got people who speak many different languages. They've got different religions. They've got different traditions and customs. And they somehow have to keep everybody happy because if people aren't happy, you can, you can force people militarily to go along with you for a while. But over time, they're going to re rebel. They're going to revolt if they're not happy being part of your empire. So you have to manage that somehow. Well, one of the things that we see is that the, the, these large empires in the 500s, lead to the invention of a whole bunch of new innovations, government techniques and strategies and structures that allow them to manage a much bigger empire. Right? The first is regular taxes, and this is a crucial thing. The, the early empires basically relied on about three different sources for revenue. One is they would conquer other territories. Right? You'd go attack somebody and loot their cities and bring back all their wealth. Right? The second is that periodically, somebody, a, a territory you'd conquered might give you tribute. Once a year, they might send you a big gift, all right? Or the, the third way is that governments actually, the king or the temple, the priests, et cetera, owned a whole bunch of land, and so they, they, they got their revenue from that land that they owned. <laughs> but those were not great sources of revenue. They either weren't very big or they um, were irregular, right? And so... With the Achaemenids, you see the foundation, the, the creation of regular taxes, that they had a regular tax system they collected on a regular basis, so the government knew it had income coming in, and it, but it was small enough, uh, as, as a small enough percentage of things that didn't destroy the economies of the places they were taxing. So this was much better than conquest and looting, and it was much better than tribute. Um, it was a steady revenue stream, and, and, and that was a great thing. The second big thing is that they standardized currencies, and this was huge. Before this, people used to trade, they'd barter for things. I'll give you two chickens for that bolt of fabric or something like that. Um, or if they did trade money, it was in the form of, there were all sorts of different coins or even just lumps of gold or jewelry or things. And merchants had to have scales and things and try to figure out how much gold was in this piece, this chunk of metal they were handing me, and how much is it worth, and how much do I sell them for this chunk of gold. And well, standardized currencies got rid of all that because now you could just look at it and say, oh yeah, it's stamped with the royal stamp. This is, I know exactly how much gold is in this. I know what it's worth. And then they could deal with it. And so that allowed for much better trade, right? Because now merchants could travel the whole length of the, the Achaemenid Empire or the Parthian Empire or whatever and know that they were going to run into the same kinds of currency at every stop. And so they could bring, they could bring currency to buy things and they knew exactly what they were getting when they sold things. So the standardized currencies were crucial. Third big innovation is the postal system and roads. Uh, the, the, the Persians pioneered this idea of building a road system that the central government actually paid and then organized the labor to build massive roads that stretched from one end of the empire to the other, often you know, 1,500 miles or so. 
And then they would maintain these roads with annual maintenance and, and putting work crews on it. And they did that because they needed those roads for two major things. One is communication. They had to be able to send instructions out to the people in the provinces, and they had to be able to get information back from the provinces about what was happening. They needed to know if there was a rebellion or an invasion or something. Second thing is they wanted they had to be able to move armies, right? If they do find out there's a rebellion over in that province, they want to be able to take all their armies from all these different provinces and move them there in a hurry, and good roads were crucial for that, right? And so they did good roads, but this led to the creation of a second thing, which was the postal system. And the postal system was a, was a crucial innovation. What they basically did is set up a bunch of posts, or, or ho usually inns, along the roads. And the posts would keep a set of horses ready. And when a courier from the central government came through, he'd, he'd ride a horse as fast as he could. And when the horse got tired, he'd stop at a post. And he'd trade horses and get a fresh horse and take off again. Um, and so the, the government maintained these posts. Um, so that they're all fresh horses for their couriers, which meant that couriers and information could travel rapidly from one end of the empire to the other if necessary. Now, it was, a, it was a side effect that these roads also helped trade because merchants could use those roads also. And having safe and clear roads that's clearly marked and are easy to travel on allowed for much more trade traffic to happen, which, of course, helped the economy of these empires. But of course, if you're going to have a standardized tax system, if you're going to organize all this road maintenance, if you're going to have a mint that's standardized currency, you need a bureaucracy. And a bureaucracy is just a whole bunch of government officials who know how to do certain processes. So you have tax collectors who actually collect the taxes in the towns, and they send them on to centralized tax collection places. And then you, you count up the money, and you have accountants who keep track of it all and who paid how much when. Um, and you keep careful records of all the taxes so you know exactly who owes how much and when, et cetera. Um, and then you have to have you know bureaucrats running the mint. They have to find gold and silver and et cetera, and then stamp coins and pay workers, et cetera, and then distribute the currency. Um, you have to have um, people who organize the road crews and, and inspect roads and maintain the roads, et cetera. You need this enormous bureaucracy. And, so, and it's really with these empires in the 500s that you start to see these bureaucracies get really big. And, and you know, by our standards today, they're not big. <laughs> but co compared to the bureaucracies of ancient Sumeria or the Assyrians or something like that, these were enormous bureaucracies, right? Um, and so these bureaucrats have to be paid on a regular basis. And this becomes a whole new class of people who keep records and, and manage things and do and shuffle paperwork, more or less. And then finally, you need to have a much more developed government hierarchy. And in places like ancient you know, Uruk, you, d you don't hear about B Gilgamesh having any bureaucrats. Gilgamesh basically just had a bunch of people who hung around him and he said, hey, I want this to happen, and they'd go sort of make it happen. That only works on a small scale. If Cyrus the Great, the founder of the Achaemenid Empire, wants to send orders to build some sort of road in the Middle East or in, in Pakistan, he's got he's to gotta know exactly who to talk to there. And there has to be somebody who knows how to organize workers there and it knows somebody who speaks the language there. Um, and so the government now needs multiple levels of hierarchies. And so with these empires beginning in 500 BCE, you start to see governments developing um, hierarchies where different layers of governments. And in, in our terms, you know, we have a federal government, we have state governments, we have county governments, we have city governments, et cetera. We have all these different layers of government and school boards and things like that. You begin, the beginning of that process is with these classical civilizations in 500 CE. That, that with you know, the Achaemenid Empire and these big empires, you start to see them dividing the empire up into territories. And, and the Achaemenid Empire, they're called satrapies. And, and each satrapy was governed by a satrap or a satrap who was sort of like a governor of a state. And then below him, that he might even break that up into, into more jurisdictions. So you start to see the government breaking up its territory into smaller jurisdictions and then appointing people to run each jurisdiction. This is a big innovation. This allows for them to have a much better sense of what's happening in each jurisdiction because the satraps send reports to the central government, here's what's going on, and then it allows them to carry out orders better. They can send orders to the satraps, I need you to put together an army because we're going to do a military campaign next summer, whatever. Right? So all of these are major innovations that allow the Achaemenid and then the, you know, the, the um, 
Seleucids and Parthians and Sassanid empires to manage a much bigger empire. And these are absolutely necessary because there's no way they could have held together those empires if they didn't have these sorts of uh, innovations that allowed them to raise money, to fund government uh, processes, and to uh, manage the entire uh, operation efficiently, right? So these are all really big innovations. And, and I'm going to talk about classical civilizations. Basically, I, I said in the last part of this lecture that from 500 BCE to 500 CE is called the classical era. We're going to see these sorts of innovations in every one of the big classical empires that I'm going to talk about, right? It's not just the Persians. It's the Roman Empire. It's the Han Dynasty. It's the you know, Marian Empire, etc. All these big empires that emerge use these same innovations. One other aspect of these civilizations I want to talk about is that these are cosmopolitan civilizations. They're made up of multiple ethnic groups. They have multiple languages, many different religions, regional identities, etc. I mean, the, the, when the Persians conquer the Indus River Valley, where Harappan civilization was, they find you know, totally different language groups and religions and customs and laws than when they conquer Mesopotamia. Right? And so... Cyrus and Darius, his son, who's the second emperor of the Achaemenid Empire, they basically practiced a sort of what's called cosmopolitanism. They basically said, okay, you people can keep you know, speaking your language, practicing your religion, all that's great. And this was a big departure because if you think about, go back to that lesson I gave on, on the Hebrew people and the foundations of Judaism. When the Babylonians conquered the Hebrew people, what they did is try to destroy Hebrew culture by taking all the Hebrew elites and forcing them to live in Babylon. And there they put them under enormous pressure to, to adopt the Babylonian religion and to adopt customs, etc. They wanted to sort of homogenize those people into their kingdom um, and make them act and speak like everybody else. And that was hard to do. Well, Cyrus and Darius basically say we can't possibly do that with a bigger empire with even more ethnic groups. So we're going to figure out a way to allow people to practice their own religions and speak their own languages, etc. And so what Cyrus and Darius would do is rather than try to impose one set of laws when they conquered a territory, they would, they would basically look at the existing laws and they'd say, okay, we're going to leave these here for a while. But then they'd start to tweak them a little bit. And they would just try to make it, they would tweak them just enough so that the people didn't feel like their laws were being thrown out, but they were now could work with the larger laws of the uh, Achaemenid Empire. And so they were pretty careful about, uh, about that, about trying to allow people to feel as comfortable as possible with their own traditions, etc., while making minimal changes to adopt, to adapt rather, to the uh, needs of the larger empire. And this worked pretty well. They, they actually avoided a lot of rebellions and things like that by not squashing people's local cultures, etc. But the third emperor, Xerxes, who was the son of Darius, he decided he wanted to homogenize his empire. He's going to try to push to get rid of some re religions, to sort of stamp out some really out there cultural traditions, etc. Um, and he runs into serious trouble. And in particular, um, there's a, in, in Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey, there's a whole lot of Greek settlers uh, who've come over from Greece, um, and, and they speak Greek, and they have Greek culture, etc. And Xerxes really tries to crush them down and make them conform to the, to, to the cultural expectations he wants, and they revolt. They rebel. Um, and, and this causes Xer Xerxes has to send huge armies over there to try to stop it. He gets embroiled with actually fighting with the Greeks in Greece, who are outside of the Achaemenid Empire. Um, this leads to his get crushing defeat at the Battle of Marathon. Um, and, and the Persians just can't, the Greeks just, just this enormous problem for them until Alexander the Great comes along and ends the whole empire. So uh, trying to enforce a cultural hom homogeneity kind of backfires on Xerxes. He thought it would make his empire stronger by having everybody on the same page. But in fact, the resistance to that led to a whole bunch of problems that ultimately would destroy the empire. Um, a similar process happened with the Seleucids. And I mentioned that the Seleucids, you know, Alexander the Great conquered the Achaemenid Empire and set up his own empire, and then he dies and his empire breaks up. And his, one of his generals, Seleucus, founded the Seleucid Empire in Persia. Well, they were Greeks, and, and they 
they tended to tolerate other people's religions and things, but they were resented for being Greek. They weren't Persian enough, if you will. And so here again, the, the cosmopolitanism of the civilization, the, the multiple ethnic groups and things, caused a constant friction for the Seleucids because even though they tried to be tolerant, they were, they were seen as outsiders. They were seen as an alien presence, um, even though they were trying to be accommodating. And so this is a, a persistent problem for big empires. How do you handle multiple ethnic groups, multiple languages, etc.? And I just want to point to one thing I mentioned in a previous lecture, which is that the the Chinese language developed, in a sense, as a way to answer this question. How do you, as a government, how do you deal with multiple ethnic groups, et cetera? And we'll talk about the unification of China later. But, um, but the language in China with using characters to represent an idea meant that the single written language could correspond to dozens of spoken languages, and this helped them to handle a cosmopolitan civilization. And this is one of the reasons China could expand and become a stable, major, big empire for most of its history, was that it, it found it easy to incorporate different language groups in because they could all use the same writing system without changing the language itself. Right? OK, so these are some of the things that unite a big empire. The last thing I want to talk about, though, is a new religion that emerges in the Persian Empire. It's called Zoroastrianism. So that'll be the part of the that'll be the subject of the last part of this lecture.